right. Good evening, Eleanor. Hello. Good evening. How are you? Very well, thank you. Thanks for having me on here. Thank you for joining us. It's been uh, it's been in the pipeline for quite some time. Hasn't happened. I do apologize. It is it is um, uh, my bad. Uh, things have just been hectic, but we are here finally. So yeah. we are here to discuss a huge topic. We've not tackled that in Silicon Roundabout before as a community, but we are hoping, or I'm hoping that this will be the first of many conversations to be had because it's, you know, while we don't think we'll have solutions, we'll ever come up with solutions, not ever, but today we're not going to come up with solutions, but um, we want to raise the awareness, at least, you know, do our part in raising the awareness bring it, uh, you know, talk about it more, discuss it more, and that is sexual harassment. And who better to discuss this with than the CEO and co-founder of Metaspace. So we're going to talk about Metaspace, but Eleanor, do you want to give us a little bit of an intro about sure. you? Who's Eleanor? So I'm, I'm officially the CTO. Uh, not the CEO, because I oh, do sorry. the technical. Oh, sorry, okay, so then the, the, first, the, the, the first mistake we've okay, the, C, yeah. the CTO. The CTO, um, so yeah, as you said, I'm the CTO and co-founder of Metaspace, which is a B2B platform on a mission to eradicate sexual harassment from the workplace. And we do that by, uh, through an anonymous employee application to submit any reports of sexual harassment or workplace misconduct um, through a data analytics dashboard on the company side. And finally, um, and this is where I come in um, as a, well, a data scientist is um, the inclusion of a natural language processing plugin that would detect sexual harassment happening in real time in workplace communications. So that's uh, Metaspace in a nutshell. And then my education, I uh, was a master's in big data and business analytics, which is basically just a fancy way to say math and coding. <laughs> big data, big, big data and analytics. Yeah. Okay. So how does a master's graduate in big data and analytics take a step towards the topic of sexual harassment? How did this happen? So it actually, the idea came from a case within a, my own class. So 40% of my class were women, which is actually far higher than within most data science communities. Usually the average is 25% uh, women. So we were actually a class that overrepresented um, in women um, in the industry, which was amazing. I was with um, some incredible incredible programmers. Um, but unfortunately, half the women in the class were harassed by one individual. And we saw a massive um, lowering in their productivity, in their morale, their willingness to actually participate. And in a master's program, I think it's far more reflective of a, a business environment than um, an undergraduate degree is because you or it was in my university anyway, because we were working on projects all together. So these women were having to be put in group projects with this individual. And so from that point forward, we we decided to, to report it to the university and unfortunately it wasn't uh, dealt with very well. It was just brushed under the, the rug and the women were told that they'd misinterpreted the situation, although there was multiple um, of them coming forward. So we realized then that the reporting process actually became as, or if not so more psychologically damaging to them than the actual sexual harassment was because they weren't believed and they didn't feel valued within um, their environment anymore. So we decided to do focus groups and gather more data. My co-founder of my um, Helena, who was at the time doing a master's in cybersecurity, and we we just discovered so many patterns. It was basically every single class had a, a, a case, um, and it definitely wasn't um, just men and women. It was you know, men were also being sexually harassed. And so we started doing focus groups and, and um, surveys. And all in all, we found that 60% of women had been sexually harassed and 30% of men, which is a far greater number than one actually um, expects, especially from men. And we then brought that to businesses and asked them how their reporting system and if they knew about sexual harassment cases within. And you had, you know, heads of HRs of these big multinational uh, companies that 
weren't dealing with sexual harassment on a systematic basis rather they were saying that you know it was very hard to deal with because it was a hidden problem and we could just tell there was a need for a solution so that's um, how we came up with metaspace okay you're the expert here um on sexual harassment you've been basically i mean out of the two of us uh you certainly are you've been researching it you've been um reading about it doing a lot of work after all it is the essence of what metaspace is all about yeah um sexual harassment um having looked for a number of different um definitions for it it's by acus for example and for those who don't know what acus is it's the advisory uh consolation and arbitration service they define it as sexual harassment and unwanted behavior of a sexual nature Mm -hmm. How would you add anything to that? Or would you say your definition differs even completely? So I think that's a really good question. It's something that I'm currently working on. Like today, I was working on this. Um, so what we've done is we've collected all the legal definitions of sexual harassment around the world. And we then collected that from international institutions as well. And I'm doing analysis on the main topics um, using NLP and the recurring effects. And I think what's quite good about that definition is that it's, it's broad enough to be able to capture a lot. And that's what's most important. In contrast, you have legal definitions worldwide that are so specific that say, for example, um, that sexual harassment just occurs in the workplace and can only be um, prosecuted if it occurs in the workplace or it can only be prosecuted if there's a physical component to it. Um, so I think what's really important that we understand is that sexual harassment is a spectrum and that any definition um, needs to be able to incorporate or, or rather encompass that spectrum. Um, and I think the best way to do it is to have a definition like theirs to say, OK, um, you know, any act um, that makes someone feel uncomfortable with sexual intent, for example, like something very broad. And then to give specific examples for people to visualize, because the main issue is that people don't visualize what sexual harassment is. So, for example, in our in our survey where we found that 30 percent of men and 60 percent of women had experienced sexual harassment, that's if we ask them the question, have you been sexually harassed? If in contrast, we give examples for example, has someone looked at you and made you feel uncomfortable? Has someone touched you inappropriately, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And just ask them, has this happened to you? That number jumps up 99% for women um, and goes wow. up considerably for men as well. So what we have to remember here is that sexual harassment is actually a normalized behavior. It's actually the normality within the workplace is that women are going to be sexually harassed. And a woman is more likely to resign from her job than to report a sexual harassment case. So when we look at the definition of it, we just need to ensure that it's able to catch everyone's experience. Um, and unfortunately today, that's not the case within companies and it's certainly not the case within our legal systems. So what you're saying is it's, you can't put one definition for it you have to use examples you have to specify certain instances certain situations that they may, might have come across and yeah. then would define it but surely that would um you know um cause some issues um misunderstandings especially when uh different cultures are concerned um i mean f f Take, 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 take the English and the French culture, for example. I mean, the, uh, the English culture, it's just, hi, how are you? You, you shake hand, for example, yeah. at best, if that. French culture, uh, it's normal to, you know, to La kiss bouche. each other on the, on, the, on the cheeks. It's, um, yeah. it's normal. If you go to the Arab world as well, um, you know, between men, it's normal. Between women, each other, it's, it's, it's also normal. But open the sexes, it's not always, um, mm. you know, something uh, welcomed. But you also go to other Arab countries such as Lebanon, and the standard is actually three kisses. So one, yeah. two, three on each cheek. I'm sorry, on different cheeks. So cheek, cheek, cheek. That's how it goes. How, you know, this might cause some people to be uncomfortable. Some might consider it sexual harassment based on the definition, but some might not. Surely you've come across that um, objection, not objection, but, you know, um, yeah. obstacle. Yeah, you, you're bringing up a really important point. Um, so sexual harassment is just about perception. 
And it's not the intention that's important, it's the impact. So if you're fam familiar with someone, you can act a certain way, but if you're not familiar with someone, you act a different way. And at the end of the day, in the workplace, it's a far more black and white space. You should not be engaging in sexualized uh, behavior or behavior that has a sexualized impact that's not consenting. And it's a very black and white line. And unfortunately, that line's not being respected today. So when we when we bring up the, the idea of culture, so for example, as you mentioned, in, so I'm English and French, but I'm currently in Spain, um, the cultures are very different. Nonetheless, as a normal perceptive human being, you tend to be able to tell when someone's uncomfortable. And it's just about that. It's just about basic respect and teaching people that they can't cross that line and teaching people to, to set their own boundaries. And it doesn't have to end in a sexual harassment report. You know, we really encourage people to just say, oh, actually that didn't make me feel very comfortable. Um, and also to encourage people to review their own behavior and say, oh, actually they didn't seem to be like particularly comfortable. For example, you know, a, a Spanish a woman with an English man uh, the Spanish tend to be far more tactile than the English. Um, so th that that man might actually feel, oh, this, this woman is actually encroaching on my boundaries. I feel very uncomfortable with this. So like it is a challenge, it is an obstacle, but culture should never be used as an excuse to justify sexual harassment and to justify that um, a sexual harassment report does not go through um, because it was a misunderstanding of culture. Because at the end of the day, if the impact is there, then that should be enough. So what are you, in this case, proposing? If we are, okay, so a sexual uh, harassment report has been filed. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll discuss the, you know, how things work, etc. Yeah. and the complications. I think we will probably discuss that in our second episode uh, yeah. when we do that, when we dig down to it. But when that report is being filed, What's the, what's the effect of that? Does that mean that employee gets terminated, basically? Um, what's, what's the outcome behind it? Yeah, well, firstly, I think it's really important to note that 99.8% of all sexual harassment cases go unreported. And as I mentioned earlier, women are more likely to resign than to uh, report a sexual harassment case. And I, I really like that you brought up, okay, what happens? Um, does someone, you know, does someone get the sack? when you have a company that has a zero tolerance policy towards sexual harassment it actually discourages reports because usually people don't want to have such negative repercussions occur to their perpetrator rather they just want the behavior to stop so this can take the form of just having a simple conversation and between you the target of the sexual uh, harassment and the perpetrator if you feel comfortable to do so but if you filed um, a report, it's usually because the behavior is repeated that you have mentioned something before and they haven't respected it. So that's when you want to get someone official involved to make the behavior stop. And from my perspective, um, I'm definitely not a moral authority on this. It's really like, and I, I will can, never- I don't think anyone else can claim that. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So I can't give you a one-stop solution of, okay, what do you do now? It will vary case by case, and it's really up to the company um, to decide, okay, what is the extent of this? Um, so at Metaspace, we provide the tools to ensure that the reporting can be anonymous, that you can collect evidence and that you feel comfortable coming forward, and so that a company can then have this all within a report. Uh, but then what that company does with it, we can provide them with guidelines, for example, how long to, it, you should take to respond, um, what are similar cases that they can base themselves off. Um, but we really encourage to just, you know, make make the behavior stop in the easiest way possible. So, you know, if that's just a conversation, um, ideal. Okay. So, okay, the, the, the idea, the very um, idea um, that you know, of, of, of sexual harassment, making it transparent, because it is a gray area. It is such mm -hmm. yeah. a gray area. And it's not, 
for those for those listening and maybe who might think, well, no, it's obvious. If somebody touches you in the wrong way, that's sexual harassment. Well, no, that's the most obvious of things. Yeah. If somebody's touching me, that's that's sexual abuse. Now, that's yeah. not just sexual harassment. So, the idea is we're trying to, like you said, uh, and like you know the definitions we've looked at, it's if it makes you comfort uncomfortable. Sorry, not comfortable yeah. in a sexual way. Yeah. But again, in a multi national organization how mm -hmm. do we convince how do we explain to certain individuals um look what you're doing is this is considered sexual harassment especially when we can't mention the name of the victim if you like so we can't mm -hmm. really bring it up how do we get those people to understand that actually this is perceived as sexual harassment. Going back to the point of the cultural clash, I'm going to mm -hmm. mention an example in a study that um, um, uh, uh, we found. I'm, we can sure, obviously share the the the, the details on that. Um, that 90 percent of women in the retail or the hospitality industry experience sexual harassment. Yeah. So waitresses, um, retail who work on, you know, fashion places, clothes places. Uh, my retail vocabulary is not the best to be honest, but, uh, but um, I'm not much of a, much of a clothes kind of person. But, um, when we compare cultures, there's a study that mentions, um, compares the difference between North American people and Brazilian people, for example, mm -hmm. how the very same action is perceived by North American people as uh, sexual harassment, whereas Brazilian people would deem the very same um, actions, and we're talking Brazilian women here, as not necessarily sexual harassment, more of a flirtatious thing, and it's made with good intentions, really. Now, yeah. I mean, if somebody, if I was to be asked, if I was to be a witness, I would consider that sexual harassment, full stop. Yeah. But how do we explain to people who are used to things in that culture if they're in a multinational organization what you this is sexual harassment we can give trainings and i'm sure lots of companies give training we know that yeah but to tell them actually no this part of what you're what you believe is normal isn't actually it shouldn't be like that yeah yeah it's it's a really complex issue but <laughs> It's also one where, so for example, with that that survey or, or study that, that you showed, one of the main issues I have with data collecting like that is that you're asking someone, you know, like without context, if someone does this, do you consider it to be sexual harassment? And like someone then says yes or no. Um, it's different. I can do something to a friend and it's not sexual harassment. And I do the same thing to someone I don't know and it's going to be considered sexual harassment. So it's, it will depend on the context and the relationship that you have with the person, whether someone feels um, uncomfortable by your actions. So, you know, you don't, I feel like when people, people are worried about being called sexual harassers from normal behavior, but what's important is that the, it's a minority of individuals that perpetrate s sexual harassment and they are repeat offenders. And it's not just like a casual behavior, for example, you know, giving someone labis at work, that's gonna actually make someone feel, okay, no, this is a sexual harassment. I feel sexually harassed. Rather, it's gonna be repeated behavior where the person usually knows that they're crossing a line and they continue to do so. That makes someone want to report the sexual harassment. Well, that's what we found from, you know, our surveys and our and our, and our data collection is that it's never just a one-off. It's always repeated over and over again and it's small uh, things. And what's really interesting is that there's a huge distance between someone um, being sexually harassed and someone acknowledging that sexual harassment. For example, they'll be like, why do I not want to go to work? Why do I feel tired when I'm there? They, they know that this one person is making them feel uncomfortable, but they don't say, they don't recognize it as sexual harassment. So I think there's definitely a lot of work to be done on just recognizing sexual harassment and getting the, I don't really like to call them victims of sexual harassment because I don't think you're a victim, it's not, 
and I don't think people want to be called victims. I prefer to say targets or someone affected by sexual harassment. Thank you very much. Yes, actually, you, that's a much better word. I didn't want to use that word. I just couldn't think of it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yes, true. And, I, and, I, and I think, you know, my, I have a friend who wrote her thesis on, on sexual assault, which is obviously on the other side of the spectrum, but she only referred to them as victims if they died. Um, if not, you're a survivor. Um, obviously, with sexual harassment, it tends to be um, a little bit, um, you know, not as intense violence um, as sexual assault. But I definitely think the words that we use are, are important to say, OK, no, I'm not a victim. I'm a target. I've been targeted um, by um, by a sexual harasser, um, um, you know, to get whatever they want out of it, the thrill, uh, the excitement. Um, Sorry, I, I think I'm going on a bit of a rant now on, on that's, words. That's, that's, no, no, that, that's, that's the perfectly use of fine. Words. That's, it, it, like, it, it's not a topic you can just discuss uh, as much as you try. You can't yeah. just discuss it in a completely, um, you know, be objective about it. I mean, you have to be objective, but yeah. you can't help but feel a bit involved in it. It's something that, it triggers emotions at the end of the day. Because, yeah. um, you know, we've all had probably experiences of people we know, heard about, heard of, or even ourselves have experienced these things and probably weren't even aware of them at one point. Only yeah. started to understand, actually, this instance, which I know somebody has went through or I went through, is actually falls under that. So, yeah, it's, it's getting passionate think, about it. I mean, it's one of those yeah. subjects you have to be passionate about. A really good, a really good test um, that we do when speaking to individuals is because um, as, as we said, like a lot of people don't recognize it when it's happening um, to, 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 to yourself. You have a far larger th or higher threshold uh, for supporting behavior that makes you feel uncomfortable. Uh, then asking the question, if someone was doing that to your closest friend, would you see it as wrong? And that seems mm. to trigger in people an acknowledgement that the behavior that they've been experiencing is wrong. Um, because it's, it's like, no, actually, this I wouldn't accept this for my closest friend or a family member. So why should I accept it for myself? Um, so yeah, that's all about recognition that's of, interesting of, perspective, of your actually. experience. Very interesting perspective. True, it is. It is actually quite true. The the the, the threshold you mentioned. Um, that that wow. Okay, that's that's interesting. That's definitely worth interesting listeners. If please do try and uh, implement that. If you if you never have, I never have for sure. But uh, yeah. you know, not 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 in certainly not in this scenario. Um, Eleanor, the subject of the or not the subject, but the the Me Too movement, the Me Too mm -hmm. movement. What's that? What effect did that have on you know bringing? the sexual harassment conversation to the table? Well, I think it was exactly that. It just brought it to light. It brought it to the table when before it just had been majorly repressed. Um, I think one major shortcoming of, of the Me Too movement and is that, okay, Me Too, but now what? <laughs> Nothing has actually changed. We're still receiving, you know, so many reports of sexual harassment and there hasn't been systematic change. and. I think it is time to demand change. Um, it's so, you know, hashtag Me Too is just a, it's just a hashtag. Um, it's just it's amazing that it brought together so many people to share their stories, and we're always encouraging people to come forward because there are so many individuals, especially men, who don't perceive the spectrum of sexual harassment. There was a really interesting study that was done um, showing how women are are so much more perceptive to small instances of sexual harassment, whilst men could only recognize the real black and white ones of, you know, touch and that were quite visual. Whilst women, you can literally tell from across a club floor, for example, when another woman is uncomfortable. Um, so I definitely think that the hashtag Me Too movement was great to getting people who had not been introduced to, to sexual harassment before um, into the conversation because it is a conversation that needs to be had with everyone. It can't be just had between women who'd experienced sexual harassment. It has to be done between everyone. Um, but I think it showed the fundamental flaws within our society that still not enough is being done and that aren't enough businesses and that aren't enough um, individuals on a political sphere actually willing to speak up and to make change that that is needed. 
um, to actually eradicate sexual harassment from being the norm um, in the workplace and in a woman's life and a man's life. So that is very, very interesting, eradicate it from the workspace, um, because that actually was going to be, it's relevant to my next question. And this is something probably that's going to get a few people triggered, but whatever, that's the point of a podcast, really, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a, you know, of a, um, a chat or a debate. Um, do you think it has anything to do with generations? So, for example, millennials, Generation Z, Generation X, mm -hmm. um, um, the 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 um, the Boomer Generation. Uh, yeah, which, I'm completely forgetting their what, what, what they're called now. But Boomers, yes, the Baby Boomers, <laughs> the Baby Boomers. That's the one. Um, do you think it has something to do with that? So, do you think that Baby Boomers? Um, you know, uh, Generation X, some even millennials, because millennials really stretch from kind of the mid 80s, really. Yeah. Um, again, not to sound ageist and not to try to uh, tread on eggshells here, but how sexual harassment is perceived by them. Because sexual harassment, the Me Too movement only started now in the mm -hmm. mid uh, 2010s and the younger generation are they seem to be far more passionate about it so is there a generational problem here is it a clash of generations older generations perhaps don't really see the sexual harassment we are discussing now as sexual harassment so we've we have actually collected data on this so i'm glad that you that you bring it up um what we found is that they aren't less likely to experience sexual harassment, but they're less likely to perceive it as so, or to name it as sexual harassment. So in our in our surveys and our data collection reports, we were interviewing everyone from the age of 16 up. So literally everyone. And what we found is that the over 50s had clicked the, so we gave examples of sexual harassment, but we didn't ask them like, oh, have you been sexually harassed until the end? So we asked them, oh, have you ever experienced this? A lot of people wrote, yes, yes, yes. Um, you know, I, I, I've been made uncomfortable by this behavior, etc. cetera. Um, but then when asking them, oh, have you been sexually harassed? Um, they actually, a lot of them said no, because they didn't perceive it as so. So, I think it has more to do with wording than anything else and getting used to the term. I think there's so much to do with language here. You know, we just spoke about earlier about the use of the word victim. Um, they might just be referring, think, thinking of it as something else. Um, I know that when I speak to my grandma about it, she's furious because she can't believe that I'm experiencing the same things that she experienced as a, te as a teenager and that it's been going on for this long. So. I'm not necessarily, I don't think, I think it's something that is continuing generation from generation, but from our data collection, it's been more about um, whether older individuals recognize their experience as being sexually harassed, um, while under 50s tend to say, yes, I have been sexually harassed at work. So that's from a, from a, from a target perspective. Yeah. What about from a harassed perspective? Because, I mean, Surely, you know, this the, the, the entire, in fact, sexual harassment conversation, I believe, it started to come to the table around the 1970s, perhaps late 60s, early 70s. Yeah, 1970s. Prior to that, it wasn't 19, which one, sorry, which was the date? 70s. 1970s, yeah. So prior to that, it wasn't really something, 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 you know, to, to, to um, talk about much. So another question, is it? You know, because I mean, the, the, the biggest victim, the, sorry, the biggest targets for uh, sexual harassment are women. Mm -hmm. Does the fact that it was a more a man dominated world back then have to do with it? Does that mean the harassers knew what they were doing? They kept at it. And those who are opposed to change now could be categorized as such? So we. I don't have any data to back this up. 
um, this is purely speculative on my experience and the experience of my network around me, but in terms of how I have been sexually harassed throughout my life, it has definitely not been a, oh, it's older men that has sexually harassed me or sexualized me and made me feel uncomfortable. It's been from people my age to, to younger. Um, you know, I was catcalled recently by a 14 year old in the street. And I thought, what is going on? Like, what are you doing? It was funny. It wasn't, but like, I was like, what is happening here? So I definitely don't think that we can make the spec, the, the statement that you're more likely, because that's kind of the statement, right? You're more likely to be sexually harassed by an older man I don't think that's true I don't think that unfortunately actually I if it was a generation problem then great it would die out soon but it's not going to yeah but it's not um it's still a repeated behavior um because as you pointed out even even though men are also targets of sexual harassment their perpetrators tend to be also men so there's definitely a trend that perpetrators of sexual harassment are men um and it doesn't Gosh, mean we are that such a problem are we <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't mean that men don't also experience it like and obviously there's exceptions of women also perpetrating it but um i think it's so i definitely think that that's not a statement to be made um as of right now perhaps i think that's a good idea to collect data on it but from from my perspective from my network from from my friends and and you know peers experience it's definitely not, oh, you know, only older men or older individuals um, are, the, are the reason that sexual harassment is still around. And also, sorry, just on a parenthesis, ahead, the, um, in terms of meta space, because we do get people who are like, oh my goodness, like, it's amazing. And then on the other side, we get people who are like, um, you know, false reports, um, you know, this isn't going to work, it's part of business, blah, blah, blah. Uh, that has not been, we have had some older men say that, but we've also had some younger men. Um, and some younger women. So, you know, you can be um, sexist and upholding the patriarchy as a 25 year old white woman, as you can as an older man. It doesn't matter, uh, you know, in terms of identity politics, I think you can say it's more likely, <laughs> but it's still, it's still a broad range of individuals who are supporting this behavior. Once again, you bring up a, you bring up a point, which I was, a, was very relevant to what I was about to ask. And that's certain types of workplaces. Yeah. I've been in a sales environment, for example, okay, on a sales floor. Um, it's quite well known that sales is a macho environment. Uh, yeah. Is it not? And, you know, it's all about uh, you know, who, who can land the better deal and who seems to be the bad you know, I'm a bad man or whatever. And I'm looking at me. I'm so good. I'm generating this much sales. Yeah. But women also have to, the women who are successful, many of them, I'm going to say most of them because I don't really have a statistic uh, yeah. to back that up, but I do know many have had to blend into that culture. Oh, and yeah. those who weren't able to do so um, simply couldn't survive it. Um, you know, couldn't last and certainly couldn't progress. People within that environment would tell you, well, based on what you're telling, what you're telling us, almost everything we do is sexual harassment. Then, whether it's the jokes mm -hmm. that we crack, um, whether it's the way we the, the we, we, we we talk to each other, all of that um, could would, would fall into that category. So what you're doing is you're trying to change our entire working culture. I personally have always hated it. <laughs> but I mean, I've always hated it because I've always thought the fact that, oh, holy, you're making some really stupid, silly, vulgar jokes um, yeah. to be mentioned in front of men or women. It doesn't matter, but it's quite, but that's the nature of the environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do we get companies like that on board here? Because I mean, I, I, I know I could, I wouldn't have a clue thinking of certain organizations that I'm aware of and I would never would not mention um, not saying that I've worked with them or I haven't worked with them I cannot confirm yeah. nor deny any of that again but I know it exists what do we do here because they will they, I know they're against it they're, yeah. they will fight it yeah so I mean obviously I'm, I'm we're in the tech industry um, you know I've had men ask me if I know what an algorithm is um, I've had men ask me if I was mentally stable enough to, to, to deal with sexual harassment, uh, I found a company about sexual harassment. And so it is something that 
you're right you just get used you just completely get used to it but what we're trying to show to companies is that by allowing and by perpetrating these environments you're losing money like for example there was a really amazing study um done by deloitte that stated that for, per fortune 500 company they were losing more than six million dollars a year due to sexual harassment cases these are big fortune 500 companies so each fortune 500 company was using six million dollars a year linked directly to sexual harassment and that's because they were creating these environments in which people didn't feel comfortable coming forward so you had an increase in employee turnover so you were losing great talent um, you had an increase in absenteeism because people just want to avoid going to that meeting with that creepy guy um, and then you had a huge loss of managerial time so when a, a sexual harassment case did come up you had these managers who were not trained how to deal with sexual harassment are then spending hours and hours in meetings trying to find out you know what should we do um, and all in all they found that if an individual was sexually harassed they were losing four days of productivity a week so it, i mean that's just huge uh, it's a five-day working week so <laughs> if you're losing four <laughs> exactly. days of productivity yeah. um so that's the whole point like sexual harassment isn't just ethically wrong it's just bad business and that's what we're trying to show companies and bring to light these hidden costs of sexual You're aspect. speaking the corporation's language, basically. Let's be honest. You're not moral. Yeah. You're not ethical. We're going to talk to you in a language yeah. that you understand. Money. And fortunately for us, um, and this is specific to the EU, but um, the UK has something very similar coming out, is that by December of this year, all member states in, the, in Europe have to put within their national law a whistleblowing directive which states that all companies have to have an anonymous reporting system to allow for whistleblowing. And this includes everything from um, fraud, workplace misconduct, to harassment and sexual harassment. Um, and it's called the EU Directive 2019-1937, if anyone's interested in looking it up. Um, so it's not only an ethical issue, it's not only a financial issue, but today it's a legal issue you know companies have to become compliant with having proper reporting platforms for for their employees so it's definitely the time now you know and as we spoke about before you know hashtag not me um you know the time is now for change and that's why i'm so glad that we've had such a positive response to the work that we're doing because it just shows that the, this movement is is all coming together and we hope that over the next few years as we see companies starting to actually implement our systems we'll we'll see a shift in the workplace as you said it's not just about sexual harassment it's about shifting people's mentality um and a workplace is a place of work um and it's a place where everyone should be comfortable to you know attain um their you know professional crescendo some will argue, some people yeah. will argue, and... I feel like this is the devil's advocate coming out. <laughs> no, but, you know, it, it, like, it, some people will argue, and, and rightly so, mm -hmm. that this is a form of bullying. Yeah. And we have laws and directives, etc., against bullying. So why do, we have to, why do we have to make it specific to sexual harassment? Why can't this simply be um you know a a a a a subsection on the bullying i think sexual harassment has a far more intimate scope um that affects so it is a form of bullying right like there's no doubt about it um and you know we could talk about we talked about definition earlier but like there's such an umbrella for for workplace behavior um but well, firstly, clearly the laws about bullying aren't working because <laughs> you know there's loads of uh, cases happening. coming out still happening. Um, but secondly, and I think this is important, we've been touching on it, upon it throughout, is that sexual harassment is far more gendered than bullying is. Um, it is far more women experiencing sexual harassment. It's far more an issue of of sexism uh, throughout the workplace that is being not only perpetrated but encouraged and there are some environments where it is encouraged um so that's why i think it is different 
um, because it is far more gendered than than bullying would be. Uh, that doesn't mean I think you know there's so many we hear a lot about you know women bullying uh, men, women bullying other um, uh, women. But when it comes to sexual harassment, the clear trend is that women are sexually harassed by men. Is there a link, perhaps, in your um, experience, in your expertise, the research that you have done, between sexual harassment and EDNI, equality, diversity, and inclusion? Uh, definitely, <laughs> definitely, definitely. There's, and this is what I'm really excited about with Metaspace is that we hope that we'll be able to start finding these trends in companies that, okay, in sectors like this, with companies that look like this, you're more likely to have sexual harassment cases. And I mean, we will need the data to back it up. So again, I'll make another speculative assumption that I hope in the future will be backed up. But male dominated fields in hierarchical um, shaped companies, um, these companies are the most at risk of having multiple perpetrators of sexual harassment that go unnoticed and most at risk of having people not report sexual harassment and instead leave their job rather than actually go through the painful process of reporting. Um, so they're definitely linked and that's why diversity is so important in the workplace. Um, and I mean, with Metaspace, obviously, we're doing something that's deep tech. Um, so we can talk a bit. And I think probably on our next talk, we'll go a bit into like the importance of um, having diversity in algorithms. Um, but there's there's certainly a link like you're, you're completely right. 100%. Is there a link, not just a positive one, but perhaps, you know, not to be a devil's advocate here trying to bring up the negativity, but uh, an organization that doesn't necessarily have the best sexual harassment record, is there potential that they would not have a good EDI record as well? I mean, again, spe speculative. I mean, I, I couldn't say, honestly, it's it's starting to encroach on territory that I'm no longer an, ex an expert in, to be honest. I, um, I think like in times of sexual harassment, all I can say is that, um, yeah, the trend that we're starting to see is that in male dominated um, sectors with hierarchical where the men are in higher positions, uh, we certainly see um, more sexual harassment. Uh, then getting into a different discussion on diversity, at my current knowledge, I can't begin to discuss it. Well, I'll tell you what, we are going to have that next, uh, that, ne that next episode of ours. In that one, we will focus uh, completely on Metaspace, how it actually works. Because for those listening, um, there is a lot behind Metaspace, guys. This is um, something um, we in the community are very passionate about, something I personally am so passionate about. Um, the guys at Metaspace have been doing some incredible, incredible work, um, which we will talk about uh, in the next episode. Uh, but before we finish here for today, I wanted to say, Eleanor, that we've started having those conversations now at Silicon Round about, this is obviously the first of its kind around sexual harassment. We have had a women in business or women in tech a conversation. Um, with uh with directors at uh deliveroo uh rahma javid and we are actually soon due to have a uh, debate on that a discussion a panel discussion which um you know it, it, there we will have an open discussion um about edni women in business and tech as well as sexual harassment so be sure to look at your inbox where you will receive a lovely invitation to have to have the to have you um join us for that it would be great to have you on that one uh because yeah i think like you said those topics are so interrelated yeah we are simply gonna go deep diving you know deep into too much detail um mm -hmm. which you know they have they will have a platform to discuss but not today um to wrap up, it's a difficult topic. It's a very challenging topic. Do you think we'll come up with solutions anytime in the next few years? Yeah, I mean, we're, I, I can definitely tell that, and, and people might think it's, it's silly, but just having this conversation um, 
and perhaps you know if you listen to this podcast you're then you know bring it up at the table at dinner uh you uncover so many things and you uncover so many of your close networks experienced that you'll realize what a massive problem it is you're literally just opening pandora's box but when we have these discussions um it also means that we're looking for solutions and that is what's really important about these discussions it isn't just bringing to light the problem but thinking okay how can we solve this and we're definitely seeing within the tech community that so many people are trying to stop um, all forms of harassment um, and you know that goes back into diversity um, but within sexual harassment we're also seeing more and more people speak up about it so I'm really excited about the sphere over the next few years and I'm excited that you know hopefully Metaspace uh, will be part of that movement and lead uh, lead the way to make it a you know tech um, a tech uh, sort of orientated solution um, in which we can you know really push people to set their own boundaries to increase reports of sexual harassment and encourage companies to just deal with it um, and not you know change their mentality away from we don't have cases of sexual harassment which is what they currently say and instead say mm. yes we do but we're dealing with it we have um, we have systems in place to deal with it so that's what I think we'll see over the next few admitting years. is the first step to actually yeah. tackling the issue yeah admit that we have admit that we have an issue well that is exactly what Metaspace is here to do. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm one of your biggest fans, uh, guys. It's yeah, but I think we will leave that to the next episode. Eleanor, it's been fantastic having you yes, today. Thank uh, you. We were never going to come up with different answers. Um, yeah, I was just here to ask some annoying questions, but Not as well. the reason I have to ask these questions is because of my desire to tell those who object who have those objections that mm -hmm. actually there's no ground behind it. You don't really have much of a ground to stand on. This isn't a hundred years ago. This is the current uh, world yeah. we live in. Get over it. Yeah. Learn how to deal with it. This is an issue. We need to deal with it. If it makes you uncomfortable, I'm sorry. Good. But imagine how it may, <laughs> exactly good. Yeah, imagine good. How, it, how, how it feels for others who have been yeah. experiencing seeing this for so long and they've been quiet about it. Yeah, so yeah. yeah, I'm gonna get a bit too passionate if I keep on going now. I feel I feel like that I'm getting a bit too passionate now. So thank you so much, Eleanor. Yeah, thank it's you been for having me. Great having you. You're most welcome. Honestly, it's been great having you. And I already look forward to the next episode where we discuss Metaspace. Guys, the next episode will be technical. It's not just gonna be about discussions, it will be technical. And you will see, hopefully, at least, hopefully, um uh, why. Metaspace is set to be such a great product and really hopefully play a part in pushing us towards a better society. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you very thank much, Eleanor. So I look forward to the next one. Yes, Have a great evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>